Baruchim Abayim, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bet Piro Community Center, where tonight the Chazak organization is proud to join forces with an organization that is very well known throughout the Jewish world for saving thousands of marriages in our community. I want to thank uh, the staff of Shalom Workshop, Shalom Task Force, for helping us put the, tonight's event together. Bas Yakovics and Ari Jakovitz and Dr. Singer and Rabbi Sakhov, who we'll hear a little bit later from. Thank you very much for all your help. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> a few quick announcements before we begin tonight's program. We'll start off with the upcoming Chazak events and programs that are going to be happening in the community. Starting tomorrow night, every Monday night for ladies, we're going to start the women's uh, program's weekly classes. This time it's going to be in uh, Kew Garden Hills. In Rabbi Savitsky Shul with Rabbi Tzivi Echiyayev, the Taras Mishpacha Refresher Course for ladies only, that's at 8.30 p.m. <laughs> that was not in our weekly emails and partial papers because it was a last minute uh, event to organ uh, we, we organized last minute to be eight weeks. So that's going to be Rabbi Savitsky Shul on 73rd Avenue in Kew Garden Hills. Uh, keep track of everything, there's a lot of Chazak events coming up. So then we have on Tuesday night for ladies once again, Right over here in the back room, we're going to be having a special class on uh, Tznius and fashion by Sharon Lingard, very famous lady. Uh, we encourage all the ladies to come to that. We're going to be having a dairy buffet as well. It's $10 admission. Wednesday nights, right over here in this room, for men only, we're going to have a special class on Taras Mishpacha by uh, my brother, the founder of Chazak Rabbi Elam Arab, for men only every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. And this Thursday night, we're going to be hearing from... Uh, you guys are going to be hearing from him today, but you're going to love him so much you're going to want to come hear him again. This Thursday night, we're going to be having the one and only Rabbi Pesach Kronen once again uh, at the, the Bet Eliyahu Synagogue, which is in Fresh Meadows. Then, Monday night, a week from tomorrow night, we're going to be hosting Rabbi David Orlovsky live right over here in Bet Gavriel. So all these events and a lot more that are going to be happening are all uh, can be found on the Chazak Parsi papers. We left a few on his chairs. I actually do want to mention two more uh, events three actually, very quickly. The, the Lag Bomer Sutzia that we're involved with, Motsu Shabbos, May 9th, and Sunday, May 10th. That's, that, that's good. Thanks for your help, guys. So, uh, May 9th and May 10th, you'll see once again the flyer suits that are worth $500, $800 in stores. Famous makers originally made in me to measure suits. All suits only $150. Uh, the proceeds will be going to Chazak's new after-school program, review program, that we're going to be starting for local kids in yeshivas. Kids that have success in yeshiva are kids that will continue to having success and not going to go off the derech, anything along those lines. This is a very new program that we're going to be hopefully working on. Lag Baomer Chazak will be having a men's only celebration in one of the local restaurants. Music and dancing, delicious gourmet. It's going to be unbelievable. Uh, Wednesday night, May 6th. And uh, one more announcement is about ebates.com, which is a site where you get special discounts uh, for uh, shopping online. And whoever signs up through Chazak, Chazak gets $25. So we can use those that, uh, towards uh, our different programs. So you can go to chazak.org, cngzaq.org for all these events. Check it out. It's, uh, obviously, it's an amazing thing. about Hashem. I could go on and on about the different programs. But that's not why you guys came in to hear uh, me speak. I have the honor, uh, they gave me the honor to introduce, I could call him a man that has literally changed the lives of thousands of people. Uh, he's been the featured speaker at our big Chazak event for the last three years. He's a man that actually lives over here in Kew Arnold's aside for giving inspiring shirim and lectures uh, to thousands of people over the world. He's a famous author of the Magid series, the Magid books, and he's also a Molong, just by the way, a plug for that. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine, it's my honor to start off the evening by calling on Rabbi Pesach Kron. Loud round of applause, please. It is such an honor 
and a privilege to be able to come to speak to all of you here at Chazak. When I see Shimon Ko Yaakov, and I know that by tomorrow morning, every word that we say here tonight literally will be heard around the world because of TorahAnytime.com. Chazak and TorahAnytime.com are from the greatest organizations in the world. Shimon's father is here. He hadn't been well. We wish you a full shleima, and Hashem should bench you and your wife that you should see great nachas from all your wonderful children and grandchildren. It's a pleasure also to be able to partner together with the Sholem Task Force with Mrs. Bat Basia Kovacs and of course Rabbi Sokolov who all of you will be hearing from tonight throughout the workshops. The Torah tells us something very interesting. What? The shul also. The shul? Yeah. Bet Gabriel. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> Bet Gabriel. Okay. Um, when the Torah tells us that Hashem decided Lo tov heyos he'odom levado It's not good for a person to be alone. So then the Torah writes a few words and these words are the whole structure of marriage. Hashem says Es Eloi, I will make for him. Now listen to these two words and you'll see this is what marriage is all about. Ezer, a helpmate, kinegdoi, alongside him. Ezer is a helpmate. That's really what marriage is all about. That the man helps his wife, the wife helps the man, the man helps bring out the potential that the wife has, the wife helps bring out the great potential that her husband has. And then there's kinegdoi. What does kinegdoi mean? The simple meaning of Kinegda means alongside, opposite. And in the beginning, when a couple gets together, when they're going out, or the first couple of weeks and months of marriage, it's Kinegda alongside. They're, they're so alike, they, they can't believe it. I mean, I got to tell you some of the things that young Hassanim and Kalot have told me. You know, we are so alike, there's nobody that was ever created like us. We both want to live in Israel. <laughs> and another couple actually told me, do you know, we both studied in Israel, we didn't know each other in Israel, and both of us, on the way back to America, we didn't take a direct flight, we both ended up in Switzerland because we love the mountains. I ask you, is that not, we're so alike. Do you know that one girl actually told me we both use Crest with Tata control? <laughs> Could you believe that? So now is that not a marriage made in heaven? That they both use the same toothpaste? I mean, what else is there in marriage, right? But what happens? What happens a few weeks or a few months after getting married? All of a sudden, the connect doll is a little bit different. It's opposite. You know, all of a sudden, he begins to realize She's a day person. I'm a night person. You know, she wants to go to sleep by 10.30. This guy was learning in the yeshiva. He first came home back to the dorm at 10.30. That's when the night begins. And she says, what are you talking about? I got to get my rest. I'm going to work. I'm supporting you tomorrow, right? You go, you go into the kolel to learn? Or, you know, I'm the one that has the job now? So all of a sudden, you know, he wants to, you know, start talking and doing everything, you know, at 10.30 at night, and she wants to go to sleep. And then... They begin to find out, hey, wait a second, he's a spender, and she's not a spender. You know, usually you don't ask these questions when they're going out. Like every time he sees a bakery, he's got to buy a Danish, right? And she, you know, she's traveling three miles, you know, to get tomatoes that are one cent cheaper per pound. You know? Or well, sometimes it's just the opposite. So all of a sudden, you know, they're beginning to, you know, to get a little bit frightened. And you know what's one of the things you wouldn't believe a problem in marriage? And nobody asked this question in advance. He's a neat freak. You know, he's so neat that, you know, he's picking out, you know, the breadcrumbs from the toaster oven. And she's a holy wreck. You know, what happened when she was a kid, her room was such a churban, her mother said, just close the door so nobody will see it. You know? That's not a way to train your daughter. You know, just close the door so that when anybody comes into the house, you know, I'm telling you, you know, I'm a mohel, you know, so uh, what happens is sometimes I come to visit the baby the day after the bris, you know, I have to take off the dressing. So when we do the bris, it's in the synagogue. 
So you don't really know everybody looks so nice and fancy. I come back the next day, I can't believe this is the same woman. This is what she looked like. I can't believe it. And then I come into the house and it's a khurban, you know, the clothes are all over the place and the bottles are all over. And she says to me, oh, Rabbi Kron, excuse me, I just had a baby. And I'm thinking, man, you couldn't have piled up this stuff in six months. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? So now, so now what's happening is that this guy, you know, he comes from a house where everybody was neat. And now, you know, she, she's not even folding laundry. She hasn't folded laundry, you know, since they got married. So now all of a sudden, oh, then there's some conflict, and there's the rift, the dissension, and it's connect all. So that's the reason why we come here tonight. Because, you know, not all men were created equal. And men and women surely were created equal, you know? So that's the purpose. It's so important what the Shalom Task Force is doing here tonight. Now, I want to tell you something. I shouldn't say I had an argument with my wife because that's not the right thing to say tonight, right? <laughs> so I had a discussion with my wife whether I should say this thing that I'm about to tell you right now. She said I shouldn't, and I said I should, and I'm going to do it anyway, right? Because she's not here. All right, what kind, of, what kind of example is this anyway, right? But I want to tell you where she is tonight. You know, there are many great organizations in Klal Yisrael. I mean, you, as we said, Chazak, TorahAnytime.com, and Shalom Task Force. Fabulous, fabulous organization that didn't exist 30, 40 years ago. But my wife and I are involved in an organization, and that's where she went tonight, that is one of the saddest organizations in Klal Yisrael. We were just at a Shabbaton. This organization is for divorced women. It's called Sister to Sister. You should never, ever know from it. Now, do you know at this Shabbaton that we had a few weeks ago, and tonight the Sister to Sister organization, they made like a little event for all the people who work in the organization. There are 700, 700 women with children from the age of 4 to 18. 700 divorced women. You know what that means? That there's something crazy going on. We must make an effort to make sure that our marriages are perfect. And if it can't be perfect, it's got to be good, and it can be good. And that's what Rabbi Sokolov is going to teach us tonight. Because I want to tell you, of those 700 women that were at that Shabbaton, that included thousands of children, because each one of them has two or three kids. And I want to tell you, make no mistake about it, those children are sacrifices. Many of them, not all of them, many of them are going to be kids at risk. We know how we looked up to our father and mother. Our father and mother, they were the icons of life. They were the great people. And many times we're humble, we think we're not so special, but our kids think we're special. And if we argue and we fight, they're frightened out of their minds. They're afraid. They go to sleep. They can't sleep. They're crying because they know that their parents are separating. That's the worst thing in the world. So Baruch Hashem, so we have an organization, sister to sister, that helps them. But that's secondary. This is where everybody should have been years ago, before they came to that situation. And that's why when Chazak and Sholem Task Force and people like Mrs. Kovacs and Rabbi Sokolov and Yaniv Meirov are making these things, that's the purpose. No marriage is perfect. And I'm going to show you something now that you will not believe. And that's why I want to show you this. It's not that no marriages are perfect. What I mean to say really is that no marriage is always smooth. And now I'm going to show you something in the Torah that you will absolutely faint. Like, how in the world, why did the Torah tell us this? Now, before I tell it to you, I want you to know that we are going to talk about the greatest tzaddikim in the world. And we cannot compare ourselves in any way to the marriages. Avra, Abraham and Sarah, Yitzchak and Rivka, and Yaakov and Rachel. But if the Torah told us that even they had disagreements, then we are supposed to learn just because two people don't get along and they have a discussion, that's not the end of marriage. That's kinegdoi. 
That's why God did not allow us to marry our brothers and sisters. You know why? Because Hashem doesn't want two of the same type to get married exactly. Hashem doesn't need a clone of the same family over and over. Hashem makes it that we are different. And we're different, then we have to learn to adjust, and that's the purpose of a marriage wor workshop, to show us how to adjust. Now I want to show you something about Abraham and Sarah. You won't believe this. Now you could imagine, if there's a kid in the family, we know all these type of things. A kid is the family, he, he's at risk, right? And, and now the father says, listen, you know, let him stay here. I'll take care of him. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give him unconditional love and he can stay here. And the mother says, listen, no, he's terrible. We've got to get him out of here because he's going to ruin the rest of the children. And that's what happened with Avram and Sarah and Yishmael. Avram said, let him stay here. And Sarah said, no, get him out. He's going to spoil Yitzchak. Vayomer Elokim el Abraham. God says to Abraham Avinu, Bereshis Chafalo Posikit Beis. Al Yera Beinecha Alana. Don't feel bad for this child and his and his um, Amosecha and his mother, which is of course his maidservant. Kol Asher Toymer Alecha Sarah Shema Bekola. Whatever your wife tells you, whatever Sarah tells you, you gotta listen to her. And Rashi says, you know why? Because Sarah was greater in Ruach Hakodesh. She was a greater Nivyah than Abraham was a Navi. Why is the Torah telling us this? So that when a husband and a wife have a discussion, they shouldn't be frightened. Abraham and Sarah also had a discussion. And they went to the rabbi, the rabbi was Hashem, and Hashem told them what to do. And that's what, it doesn't mean they didn't get divorced. They had a discussion. Now listen to this, you won't believe this. You remember when the, uh, the Malachim, they come and they tell Abraham that, you know, your wife's going to have a baby, right? And you know how old she is, right? She's 90. Sarah laughs and she says, My husband is an old man. There's no way he's going to have a child now. We're not going to have a child. I'm 90. He's 99. It's not happening. So what does Hashem say? Listen to what Hashem says. You won't believe it. Hashem says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and she said, I could have a child, I'm old. That's not what she said. She said, my husband is old. Why did Hashem change? Rashi tells us an amazing thing. The Pasuk changed Hashem, saying, change it, because of the peace in the family. Because she really said, my husband is old. No husband wants to hear from his wife that he's over the hill. Right? So could you imagine? Hashem had to switch what Sarah said because he was worried maybe there'll be a Shalom bias problem between Abraham and Sarah. That's unbelievable. But that's what Rashi is telling us. Because it doesn't make a difference what age you are. There's always going to be differences. And Hashem wanted there should be peace between Abraham and Sarah. So even though Sarah said that her husband is old, Hashem changed it and said, you know, she said she's old, so she shouldn't have left. She should have faith in me. But the Torah is telling us, oh, wait a second. You see, Abraham and Sarah also had discussions. There could have been a Shalom bias problem, and Hashem avoided it. And that's what the marriage workshops are all about, to avoid understanding misunderstandings. And to understand that we can argue, we can agree to disagree. Nobody's going to think the exact same. We have different mindsets. <laughs> now listen to this. The Nitziv tells us an amazing thing. Rivka, she sees that the Eliezer is coming. Vateda es Yitzchok, she sees Yitzchak and she falls off the camel. Vatipo me'ala gamal. She is such a holy person. She can't believe she's in, in the vicinity of a holy person. Vayema ela Evet. And she says to Evet, who is this? Who is this person? And he says, you know, this is going to be your husband. And she was in awe, total of awe of Yitzchak. Now, listen to this. The Nitziv asks a question. You know, Yitzchak was blind. He didn't know that Esau was really a Rasha. He thought Esau was a Tzaddik. So why didn't Rivka say, my dear husband, it's not your fault. You're blind. Esau is a Rasha. He's fooling you all the time. Yaakov is the Tzaddik. You think Esau is the big Tzaddik. He's not. And listen to what the Nitziv tells us. It's an amazing thing. And Bereshis Chavdalet, Samachay, he tells us, 
V'loi hoisa im Yitzchak. Her relationship with Yitzchak was not like Sarah with Abraham or Rachel with Yaakov, that if they had something to say, they could say it. She was so in awe of her husband that she could not even question him. She could not say what was on her mind. And the Torah is telling us that's not the relationship you're supposed to have. That's not good. A husband should be able to say to his wife whatever is on his heart. He should say it nicely. And a wife should be able to say to the husband whatever is on her mind. Not like Rivka that couldn't say anything. And finally with Yaakov. Remember when Rachel didn't have children. I'm sorry. Okay. Someone could get that. I'm sorry. If Rachel didn't have children. Thank you. And she says to Yaakov, bring me children. And he says to her, What am I instead of God? What do you want from me? Pray to God. That's how you talk to a wife. Hashem says in the Medrash, he says to Yaakov, That's how you talk to people that are unfortunate. Just because you had children with other wives, that's how you talk to Rachel. Hashem got angry at Yaakov and punished him, the Medrash tells us. So why is the Torah telling it to us? You know why? Because when you have an argument, don't be afraid. It happens. It happens with Abraham and Sarah. Yitzchak and Rivka couldn't be so open with each other. She was too in awe of him. And, and Yaakov said something to Rachel and Hashem said, that's not how you talk. And that's what a workshop is all about. So we shouldn't get frightened. And you know, my father, Alva Shalom, he once told me something. It's an amazing thing. And again, in this thing is what marriage is all about. The word united, you know how to spell the word united? Write it down, you won't believe it. And the word untied is spelled with the exact same letters. United and untied. You know what the difference is? Where you put the I. Write it down, you'll see. Where you put the I. That makes a difference whether the word is united or untied. And that's the lesson in marriage. Where you put yourself. Are you always first? Everything has to be the way you want it? Then chas v'shalom. It's going to be untied. That's how a shul is untied. That's how a community is untied. That's how a marriage is untied. Because people become selfish. Because they're thinking only about themselves. But if they put the eye in the right place, then it's united. Then we can have a united family, a united community, and a united Kalal Yisrael. So I know that Rabbi Sokolov is going to give you many, many bits of wonderful advice. I'll give you one of them. I once heard this from a good friend of mine who's a marriage counselor. I don't know why all my friends are marriage counselors, but whatever. <laughs> and he once said that the Torah tells us that Hashem said to Cain, La Pesach Chatos Roivates. Sin rests at the door. And Dr. Abba Goldman, you know what he said? The first thing when you get into your house after a whole day, whether you're in yeshiva, in the workplace, whatever it is, the first thing should be something positive. No matter, even if you got a ticket, if you lost your license, you got into an accident, or the kids got thrown out of school, that's not the first thing you tell your spouse when you walk into the house. The husband should say, oh, you know something? Ah, oh, the kitchen smells great. Or else he could say, oh, you know, I made a great business deal today. I heard a great shiur. Or I heard something, great news in Eretz Yisrael. Or else, the wife, when she sees her husband after a whole day, ah, the kids did something wonderful today. I baked your favorite chocolate cake. My mother called, she decided not to come. <laughs> you know, something that's going to make him smile. <laughs> so that's a simple rule when you walk into the house even tonight with your kids they're all going to be up watching the Mets and the Yankees tonight don't get upset and the Mets better win but that's something else but anyway but, but they're going to be up right don't yell just tell them I heard a great story tonight get into bed but you tell them something positive first you start with something positive it's very important. La Pesach Chatas When a husband, no matter what, you walk into the house, you're going to set the tone. Your wife is waiting for you. And the husband is waiting to see his wife. Say something positive. Say something nice. And then, of course, they can be open with each other. I just want to tell you one more thing and end with a great story. I have a dear friend, Yaakov Solomon. He's also a marriage therapist. 
And he told me something that's very, very frightening. Lately, we've been hearing so many marriages that break up within the first year, for heaven's sake. Now, we're not talking chas v'shalom where there's a medical problem and they didn't know about it. So the families deceived each other. But I'm talking regular, we thought, normal people. And we hear that after a few months or less than a year, they're breaking up and they're, they're getting divorced. What's going on? And he told me something frightening. And I want you all to hear this because this is an investment of the future. The best way that you could guarantee that your children, and there's no guarantees, but the best way that we're the closest to a guarantee that your children should have a good marriage is that you should have a good marriage. Because most of the kids who get divorced, many of them come from divorced homes. You know why? Because divorce all of a sudden becomes an option. And today when so many people, Rahman al are divorced, as I told you, with sister to sister, and there's another organization called From Divorce, so people can feel, hey, listen, you know, everybody's doing it, so, you know, we'll manage. No, that's no good. These women are so lonely, I can't tell you how many of them call me and cry. And the men are also lonely. And they're fighting for custody, and they're fighting in the battles, and the courts, and in the lawyers. It's awful. It's awful for the men, it's awful for the women. Sometimes a divorce has to be, but most of the time, if they could just somehow have listened to Rabbi Sokolov, somehow come to, to a workshop, somehow it would be better. It could be, not, not all the time. But the ones that are going to be sacrificed are the kids. They're like chess players, chess pieces. This way, this way, backwards, forwards. Yontif, Shabbos, it's awful. We've got to do everything possible to make sure that our marriages stay together and become a happy place. I just want to end just with this thing. One of the greatest stories that I ever heard. And you know, people always ask me, what's your favorite story? I don't know if I have a favorite story. I've got the top 10 or whatever. You know, and this is one of the top 10. And I can just tell you that when I told this story many, many years ago on a Tisha B'Av video, without a doubt of all the stories that I ever told, there was more reaction to this one than any other one ever that I ever told. And the story was about a couple that had a number of children. And the husband was always very much on time. And the wife, she was like, you know, more, you know, not always on time. And, you know, he would want to go to the wedding and he would say, how come you're not ready? And she would say, you know, it's not so important. Don't make like, such a big deal about it. You know, the things that were important, you know, so they got along. But a lot of things, you know, he was thinking like, why, why, do you, why do you leave the dishes till Sunday night? Why can't you clean them up Saturday night after Shabbat? Why do you have to like, no, nah, Zalo Hashuv, don't worry, it's not so important. Zalo Hashuv in Hebrew means it's not so important. I'll do it, you know, tomorrow morning. Whatever. So on the small things, she would always say, Zalo Hashuv. It bothered him, but fine. He knew for the important things, they got along well. It turned out that it was one summer, she was up in a bungalow colony with the kids, and she calls him on a Thursday night and she says, hey listen, to, to, tomorrow, don't forget when you come up Friday, bring the checkbook because we got a lot of bills to pay up here in the mountains. He said, okay, fine, and he goes right then and there, after the phone call, he takes the checkbook, he puts it into his car, so he's gonna have it, he's very organized, he's gonna have it for her. And he brings it to her on Friday, Friday morning she calls again, don't forget the checkbook, he said, don't worry, it's in the car already, fine. And he gives her the checkbook. Fine. Of course, she was very busy Friday. Shabbat morning, when he wakes up, he sees that she dropped the checkbook in the baby's crib. And that's where it was. And he was mad. What are you doing? You put the, ba the checkbook in the baby's crib, that's where it is. Okay, in the bungalow, you know, everything is tight, but you made such a big deal. You needed the checkbook, you had the bills to pay. But he figured if he says anything to her, she's going to say, Zalo Hashuv, don't worry, I'll take care of it Saturday night, it's no big deal. He goes home Sunday, he didn't say a word, he controlled himself. Because he knew that he would just break up the Shabbos, you know, she'll get into an argument or whatever. He comes back the next Friday, he walks into the bungalow colony, and the checkbook is still in the crib. She didn't touch it for a full week. He thought he would go through the roof. <laughs> but he figured, listen, it's Friday afternoon, you know, it's right before Shabbat. If I make a big deal, it's going to ruin the Shabbat. You know, the kids will be upset and everything. And she's going to say, Zalo Hashuv, you know, I got busy or whatever. And, you know, so, fine. He goes back Sunday, he doesn't say a word. Tuesday, he gets a frantic call that she was rushed to the hospital. She was expecting a baby. I think it was their sixth or seventh child. 
and he runs up to Harris Hospital. He was working in Lower Manhattan. It took him about two and a half hours to get to the hospital. When he comes into the hospital, all his friends and relatives, they're all in the lobby. And he takes a look at them and he sees, he knows something is awful. And Rahman al they tell him that his wife died in childbirth. The baby lived, but she died. And he comes back and he walks into the bungalow calmly and the checkbook is right where it was. She still hadn't touched it. And he took out the checkbook and he told me that the first check he wrote was for the funeral and the second check he wrote for the Hebra Kadisha. And then he took a bag and he put the bag in his closet and in the bag he wrote on the outside three words, Selo Chashuv. It's not so important. And he told me that that's the lesson that people have to learn in life before it's too late. Because most of the arguments in marriage are really petty things that are really zelo chashuv. Why didn't you pick up the shirts from the cleaners? I asked you to pick up the shirts. You were out there anyway. Why didn't you get the cereal on the way home from shul? You know, the kids don't have cereal. They all like Cocoa Puffs and, and you didn't get them. And most of the arguments are petty. But what happens? United and untied. You know, you didn't listen to me. So a person feels upset and they get angry and then all of a sudden the small arguments becomes a big fire of machlekes. We should thank Yaniv. We should thank Mrs. Kovacs. We should thank Rabbi Sokolov. We should thank the Shalom Task Force that they brought us here tonight. That people are going to be able to understand how to agree to disagree. How to make sure that the marriage stays because marriage is what Klal Yisrael is all about. It's all about families, it's all about legacies. When Moshe Rabbeinu was about to pass away, Hashem said to him, write the Torah on Avanim, on stones. Why on Avanim? I once heard. Evan, you know what Evan stands for? Ovois, Bonim, and Nechadim. Parents, children, and grandchildren. It only happens in marriage. That's when they can be together because Chas Vashom, outside the marriage, it's so hard to give over the Torah. Hashem should bless all of you and bless everyone that's involved in these organizations that we should be able to bring shalom in our families. Every home is a Migdash Ma'at and if we bring shalom in our families, Hashem, Be'ezrat Hashem, will bring shalom in the world and bring us the ultimate Beis Migdash. May it happen in our time. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening.